Welcome everybody to the second um, lecture of the 24th annual Lefebvre Winter Series on Aging. I'm your host, Elena Volpi, and I direct the City Center on Aging. And uh, this lecture series honors the memory of Dr. Edward uh, James Lefebvre, who started geriatric medicine on Galveston Island in 1939. Uh, he was a champion for the older patients. Um, he taught internal medicine at UTMB and later became the director, the director of Turner's and Moody's House, which is now the Meridian Retirement Community. And before he died, uh, UTMB developed the geriatric division, which has been thriving ever since. So today, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to uh, introduce Dr. Ann Newman. She's the chair of the Department of Epidemiology, the Catherine Dieter Endowed Chair of Population Health Science, the director of the Center for Aging and Population Health, and the distinguished professor of epidemiology in the Graduate School of Public Health of the University of Pittsburgh. Additionally, she's a professor of medicine and in geriatrics and the clinical director of the Aging Institute of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center and School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Uh, Newman received her bachelor's degree, degree, medical degree, and a master's of public health at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and she did uh, her, um, her um, uh, residency and fellowship and postdoctoral training at the same university. And immediately after uh, completing her uh, training, she became a faculty at the same University of Pittsburgh, and she climbed up the academic ladder, and she's now in the position that she holds. Um, in a very broad stroke, her research focuses on how aging changes health and function in older people. And that's just a very generic thing in a very, very succinct summary of her 183 pages CV. Um, her research has been continuously funded by the NIH since the start of her academic career. She's been the principal investigator of many NIH grants among which the most famous, at least among the UTMB investigators, is the Health ABC study, uh, which has generated and continues to generate a treasure trove of data uh, on how aging changes body composition and function. She's a very prolific scientific author, having published um, more than 700 papers in peer-reviewed journals, plus a number of book chapters and review articles. She is currently the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Gerontology Medical Sciences. And Dr. Newman has recently served as a council member of the NIA Advisory Council on Aging and has been reviewer and a chair on numerous other NIH study sections and other review panels and advisory boards. She has received many honors and awards, among which she's been elected every year since 2014 as the Thomson Reuters World's Most Influential uh, Scientific Minds for Clinical Medicine and Social Sciences. In uh, 1995, she also served as a Pennsylvania delegate uh, to the White House Conference on Aging. Um, Dr. Newman has also been an exceptional mentor to many successful graduate students, medical students, and uh, postdoctoral fellows and junior faculty. So we're really, really honored to have Dr. Ann Newman today as a speaker for the 24th The Fever Winter Series on Aging. And the title of our talk is Why is Age a Risk Factor in Size from Population Studies? Ann. Well, thank you so much for your lengthy introduction. <laughs> um, I really am honored to be here and to have been invited by people who I hold in such high esteem. I collaborate with uh, the geriatrics division. We have a pepper center in Pittsburgh and have many joint pepper center activities. But I've never been to Galveston before. Jim just asked me if I'd ever been out of Pittsburgh before. <laughs> Yes, but just hadn't made it all the way down here. So I appreciate your kind introduction. And I'm very honored to, um, to speak um, with the um, 
memory of this wonderful professor, Dr. Lefebvre. I um, met someone here, um, Amelia Collins, in the audience who told me that she actually knew Dr. Lefebvre and worked with him and that he was quite a gentleman, a true Southern gentleman. So I'm really honored to be here to speak to you today. Up in the right-hand corner is a picture of the city of Pittsburgh, though right now the rivers are covered in ice. So uh, we've all agreed today that uh, fog is much easier to take than, than ice. So um, this talk um, derives from a lot of um, the teaching that I've done and, and many grants that I've written when I'm asked um, for people who are studying different population studies, um, what should we measure? How do we understand aging? And um, really beginning now to focus on age itself as opposed to only disease. And I think that everyone knows this, that age is a strong risk factor for morbidity and mortality. It's so well known that it's a given and people almost put it out of their mind and simply when they're doing research just put age into an equation and adjust it away. But what I'd like to talk with you about is what we're beginning to understand about the biology of aging and how we might um, better use that understanding in our research. So here's a slide that shows the risk of developing cancer within age intervals in the US. Um, I looked up the most recent statistics, and this graph has not really changed at all. Um, and what you see is that not only that the risk of cancer goes up substantially from people who are under 50 to over 50 and, and over 70, but this is an exponential growth curve. It increases very dramatically. This picture shows the risk of cardiovascular disease. How strong is age compared to other risk factors? Well, there are a lot of people who don't behave well and they don't take care of themselves, and so it's not surprising that they have a risk of cardiovascular disease. But if you look here, take for example, um, men who are age 60, that's the blue bar, and they are smokers, no other risk factor. Their risk of having cardiovascular disease is almost 10% in 10 years. So that's a pretty substantial risk. But look over here at the men who have no risk factors, don't smoke, their risk is even greater. And people are surprised when they've taken really good care of themselves their whole lives and they see someone that they know or they themselves experience a health problem when uh, they get to be older. But this is, uh, this is the effect of time um, that increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and the damage that comes with living a long time. Um, and so again, you see this age gradient of risk that's sixfold over 20 years. It's very similar to that increasing risk of cancer. It goes up very, very quickly. Whereas the risk of smoking only doubles the risk of cardiovascular disease compared to that risk of age increasing it sixfold. Now, age isn't always the same for every person. This slide shows the risk of breast cancer, and this goes up with age. But very interestingly, in the dotted line, it goes up with age more in women who have a late menopause. They've been exposed to estrogen for a longer period of their life, and there's an interaction, we call this, between their menopause experience and their age that increases the risk more than their um, age alone might indicate. There's also the issue of age-specific trends. This is data showing the risk of colon cancer in different age groups. These are the youngest, 20 to 29, 30 to 39, 40 to 49, and so on in these fine age strata. And what you um, see is that over time from the 70s until 2010, in these older age groups, the risk of colon cancer has gone down. Hardly anybody who's 20 to 29 gets colon cancer. Um, and if you simply would age adjust the risk for colon cancer, you would never see that there's an epidemic of colon cancer in young people. So you can't just take age as a number and just adjust everything for age, or you will miss age-specific trends. This is another um, very important paper that showed the importance of looking at age groups, age very specifically. This is the risk 
of poisoning deaths from 2000 to 2015 in non-Hispanic whites age 45 to 54. In this paper, they showed the risk in age strata, and um, it was only in this age group that you saw this very prominent effect of deaths due to poisoning. Most of these are opioid deaths. And this was one of the first papers to, recommend, to recognize that we had an opioid epidemic because everybody else was adjusting the data for age and not looking at specific age groups. So in my own work, I was very interested in why age is a risk factor and whether it's really all the health conditions that people develop with their age. This is data from the cardiovascular health study where we adjusted for 78 variables. Of course, they all didn't um, make it into the um, statistical model. But the point was that there was nothing that we could do that would completely explain this age effect. This is the risk of total mortality increasing almost five-fold across age less than um, 69 to greater than 85, cardiovascular disease, stroke, cancer, really strong for dementia death, pulmonary death, infections, and other causes of death. Um, and we were able to explain part of the uh, contribution of chronologic age to the risk of death. But um, there were very few other factors that explained every cause of death. So why does age do this? What is age um, really telling us? Here is um, another paper that looks at multiple causes of death. And again, you see perhaps more clearly than that last slide because it focuses on fewer rates. But these are not deaths, but disease rates, where the risk, you see this exponential increase in all of these conditions. Um, so the question is, is chronologic age, once you account for all these other factors, is it really um, more than a number? And I hope to convince you that it is. And it's something that we've learned a great deal more about. So there's a lot of things packed into the age as a number. Um, first of all, there are cohort effects that we often ignore, but they're very important that in that the exposures can differ from people who were born a long time ago to people who were born more recently. Um, for example, um, the Health ABC study was mentioned. These people who were in this study were born between 1916 and 1925. And what did they experience? They were um, infants at the time of the flu epidemic. They grew up during the Great Depression. And they were kids getting their colds and earaches at a time when there wasn't penicillin. So these people are um, going to be very different older people than people who were born in a later time where these um, medical amenities were available. Age is also telling us about um, time-dependent exposures. So the longer you live, the um, more you're exposed to things in the environment. It may be that you do this yourself by smoking for a long time. But even if you don't smoke, you're exposed to pollutants in the air, to uh, ambient radiation. There's radiation all around us. And over time, um, these things affect how we age. The presence of chronic disease is something that I've been very interested in. Um, age is telling us about the accumulation of multiple chronic health conditions. But um, what we've really focused on is the idea of measuring these things at what we call a subclinical level and what this can tell us about someone's age. And then there's the intrinsic repair capacity of aging that um, is what we now refer to as biologic age. So um, this aging, this basic biologic age, is the accumulation of damage and repair in cells, tissues, and organs and people that occurs over time. And it results in a loss of function. And we've always thought that aging, in this sense, is universal. It's detrimental, for the most part, in that it decreases function, and also that it's e inevitable. Um, animal models have um, shown us, though, that aging does not appear to be um, universal and inevitable, and can be, to some extent, reversed or at least forestalled. So when I teach um, about age, um, now we can begin to look at whether risk factors are risk factors for disease or whether they're risk factors for um, 
aging itself. So in the classic way we look at diseases, we look for what we call modifiable risk factors. We look at things that people do or things that they're exposed to that damage their cells, alter their tissue function and organ function, and lead to disability and vulnerability. But these are select phenotypes. Cardiovascular disease has a very clear pattern. Um, something like Parkinson's disease has a very specific uh, pattern that doesn't affect everybody. Some people do not get diseases. Whereas when we think about aging, everyone gets aging. And we can think of that as the other side of the equation here, that the aging is due to intrinsic factors such as damage due to oxidative stress, hormonal factors, shortening of telomeres on your chromosomes, inflammation, and even a genetic predisposition. Um, but they act through many of the same pathways, but the phenotype now is universal. Um, everyone ages. What this model allows is that the modifiable risk factors can also act on uh, intrinsic factors so that Many of the fundamental biologic aspects of disease are, in fact, the same fundament fundamental biologic aspects of many diseases. Um, so these um, biologic aging factors have been grouped together in this well-known paper called The Hallmarks of Aging that um, actually was derived from the cancer field, where there are hallmarks of the biology of cancer. There are now a agreed upon set of biologic changes that occur in everyone, even if they don't have disease. And they're shown here, um, and they're cellular processes that are very difficult to measure in human studies. Um, so the idea of geroscience was coined to try to link these biologic factors to disease. How do these factors relate to aging physiology? And these are the same factors from the previous slide, but now we are trying to figure out how these contribute to the disease processes that are common in older people. And furthermore, how do they lead to the fundamental losses of function that you see um, in older people, even if they don't have disease? So um, this has spawned a large number of efforts to estimate someone's biologic age. Um, I had a project in, um, in another country that um, the investigators told me that they knew how to do this, and they would do it by looking at the pathology. But it's really an area that um, there's no clear agreement on. My husband asked me once, why can't you just like cut through somebody's arm and like the rings of the tree, <laughs> figure out, oh. <laughs> They must have this many rings, and that's how old they are. Um, we certainly do this with um, children as they develop. You can look at a bone age during development. But um, we haven't come to agreement on how to look um, at these things to, for everyone to agree how to do it for aging. But there have been some ways that people have thought about this that I'll go through with you. Um, and they're listed here, looking at multimorbidity as an estimate of aging, looking at frailty, now looking at resilience, looking at uh, subclinical disease, and looking at um, now biologic age estimators. There's also an epigenetic clock and specific biomarkers of aging processes. And my reason to go through all of these is that truly this, there is a lot of activity going on in this area, and I just want to uh, make you aware of the full range of, of ways that people are looking at this. So first of all, multimorbidity. Um, this shows by increasing shades of blue the number of people that have no disorders, one, two, three, four, five. And what you can see is that by um, the time people are older, maybe fewer than 10% have nothing uh, wrong with them in terms of a health condition that the common thing is to have not only one, but multiple common chronic conditions. Does this explain someone's age? Then there's the um, frailty phenotype, um, which is a syndrome that was defined as having weakness, slowness, low activity, weight loss, exhaustion, and fatigue that was developed from data in the cardiovascular health study. And I had the opportunity to work on um, developing this definition. 
Um, but the idea of frailty is that it's vulnerability and that it's um, telling us about the underlying inflammation, oxidative stress, many of the processes that we now think of as being aging processes. There's also been um, an attempt to define frailty by counting multimorbidity. So there's a lot of overlap between the concepts of frailty and multimorbidity. Ultimately, you want to know if someone is at risk for morbidity and mortality. And there are many ways to get at this. This is one way. Another way is just by counting multimorbidity or even expanding um, the count of multimorbid conditions. In fact, there are now, this is one paper that listed multiple scales for measuring frailty. And they all work pretty well at finding people who are at high risk. But there are many um, ways that people have adapted it. And there are many ways uh, here that include counts of morbidity, just so you can see that there's no one way uh, to do it. Um, I thought that this paper was very interesting because it compared a frailty index, which is sort of expanded multimorbidity, to uh, health conditions per se. And both of them predict risk of death risk of institutionalization, risks of disability, hospitalization, and prolonged nursing home stays. But when you look at them together, the expanded frailty definition um, wins. And the reason that it does is it includes measures of disability in it above and beyond counts of health conditions. And so these haven't been used so much as markers of aging, but as a way to try to capture the health of a person that's due to their age. So in Pittsburgh, we've been very interested in this concept of subclinical disease. This came from the cardiovascular field, where it was recognized that um, you could measure damage to the arteries with imaging, like ultrasound imaging. And um, many people who are feeling entirely well will have a burden of damage to their arteries that's easily detectable. Um, and I was working in cardiovascular disease at the time and realized that for every test we did, the story was the same, that for every person who had a level of an abnormality that they knew about, we had just as many people who had an abnormality that they thought they were fine. So do we say that they're sick or do we say that this is subclinical? We called it subclinical because they hadn't had a clinical event yet. This is true for pulmonary function testing for looking for diabetes um, in a population that hasn't been tested before, um, looking at arthritis, that about maybe 10 to 20 percent of an older population will say, yes, I have these things, and another 10 or 20 percent you will find it if you look. Um, so anyway, um, this seems to partly accelerate one's aging in that even if there's no obvious clinical event, um, this burden of disease can um, affect someone's functioning. And we don't classically consider that as part of the disease um, unless they've had a specific symptoms like a cough for lung disease, a heart attack, a, a stroke, um, but they seem to influence decline. So we did this index of looking at an index of what we called a physiologic index of comorbidity where we ignored the diagnosis and we um, ranked people according to these five systems. Why these five? Well, we actually measured these five. We didn't have a measure of um, arthritis in this study. And these um, were the, the measures that we had, and we had them repeated over time. Um, and one of the reasons that I wanted to do this was that I became very interested in healthy aging. And how do we define healthy aging when so many people, when you do these measures, have disease that um, is measurable, though not symptomatic. And so um, my thought was that people who are really healthy should be healthy in all of these systems at the same time. Now, this turned out not to be true. There was actually a random distribution of um, abnormalities across systems and individuals in the population. And that randomness, I think, is very important for understanding then how do we sum up and call what somebody's age is. I think you need to look at multiple systems. Um, they didn't cluster. They didn't correlate. Um, at, 
statistically they did, but the correlations was like 0.1, very low. So anyway, um, did we find healthy people? Yes, we did. Um, because we had follow-up on all of these people, and we could see that the very few people who were um, having scores of 0 to 1 had a very low mortality risk. The numbers that are shown here are the mortality rates over uh, time in this population. Now, if you take uh, account of conditions or frailty index, you can find people at high risk. But what those don't do is they don't find these super healthy people who are at low risk. And so we tried to see if this could compete with age in a model. And it predicted uh, mortality as well as someone's chronologic age. And so I've been on this mission of finding things that can directly substitute for chronologic age in prediction and in that way um, validate them as biomarkers of aging. There is also interest um, in the idea of resilience and um, frailty to understand how old someone is. Um, frailty was developed as a concept as a measure of vulnerability or risk, um, but it really was applied to people who might be frail just by looking at them. Somebody who seems to be slowing down, who seems to be getting shorter, losing weight, um, that this is the idea of frailty, and what is that about? The idea of resilience um, really focuses on that response to a challenge. And um, the idea of resilience is also that it might be something that you can measure in somebody um, who's younger, who's more in midlife, um, but you might need to apply more extreme or stressors. So they're kind of the same thing, but the idea of resilience may be focusing on even less obvious changes as people get older. And I think this graph here uh, shows it very nicely. When we think about frailty, it doesn't really start to appear until people are later in life. But when you um, look at measures of loss of ability to respond to a stressor, people lose their ability to respond to a stressor um, in midlife. So perhaps this can tell us uh, how old someone is. There's lots of work on measuring resilience in animal models. And what do they do to the animals? They starve them. They don't give them any water. Uh, they give them anesthesia, cold stress, sometimes crushing them, things like this. We can't do this to people. But um, it does uh, give us sort of physiologic models of what happens when you stress an organism here. You see, um, you expect the response to that stress to go up when the stress occurs, and then to come back down. And in an organism that's older, you tend to see a delay in the response, sometimes an overshooting, sometimes an undershooting, and a lack of return to baseline. And you can also see a lack of responding a second time once there's been an initial stress, a lack of ability to respond to a second stress. So this whole concept of resilience um, perhaps can help us understand uh, someone's physiologic um, as opposed to their chronologic age. So there was a workshop at the NIA on this and a, and a paper. Um, and in looking at the literature on the human studies, most of the things that people have used have come from um, other disciplines, from cardiology, endocrinology, and infectious disease. And perhaps by gathering all of those, a battery of tests like this could tell us um, more about someone's aging. And these include a treadmill exercise test looking at oxygen consumption, glucose tolerance, which worsens as people get older, ability to respond to a vaccine, um, cortisol stress, um, and obstacle courses are often used to test someone's uh, physical abilities with uh, obstacle courses as a stressor. Um, and there are two major projects being funded right now to try to see if these really help in understanding um, someone's aging. So um, we're still left with this problem, the, a chronologic age as opposed to a biologic age. Um, and other work has been done here. What are some potential markers of these processes? This is a list that um, is a partial list, but I. I put it up here to remind myself to focus on, on these three, which are whole body measures. Um, if I am asked, um, 
by outside groups what they should measure in their younger old people or their older middle-aged people. Um, these are um, whole body measures that have been shown to be sensitive to aging. First of all, um, maximal oxygen consumption. This is a classic paper from the Baltimore Longitudinal Study on Aging. And like so many pictures of processes of aging, everything's going down. I'm so sorry to say. But um, what really bothers people when I show this slide is what these different lines are, are people who are at different levels of physical activity. And what it's showing is that at every age group, even the most physically active people over time have the same rate of loss of their maximal oxygen consumption as those who are inactive. So the activity is pushing you up, but you're still on the same uh, slippery slope. Um, this is data on grip strength that was put together across um, 12 British studies. Each color is a different cohort study. So no one study had the whole life course. But by patching them together, they were able to show that you see the same thing with um, hand grip strength. You just squeeze a device like this, and it's done routinely in many population studies. And you see this decline um, in both men and women, with men being stronger than the women, at, at, uh, especially earlier in life. And um, so the idea is that these changes are starting to occur. Um, after peak development is achieved. And um, perhaps they can be useful for understanding someone's aging. We looked at some of these measures. This is, again, cardiovascular health study data, which um, became an aging study over time. Um, and what this shows is the rate of decline in gait speed after age 70. Um, here, you see an initial increase, actually, to some extent, which could be a practice effect. But what we did was we stratified the population by people who stayed healthy the whole time and people who had health events during the time. And if someone had a health event somewhere along the line, they got switched to the other group. So, um, but even, so we took people as they got sick out of the healthy curves, which are this, the uh, dark bars here. And what we see is that even before people have health events, um, they have this loss in their speed of walking at a usual pace. And because of this, we thought this should be a good marker of an aging process. And so we looked at it in relationship to multiple um, biomarkers that we had assessed. And this is a complicated slide, but I'll walk you through it, that the dotted lines are measures of functioning in healthy people, and they're all going down. And then we measured these biomarkers. And what you see is that these biomarkers, IL-6, Cystatin-C, which is a measure of kidney function, and adiponectin, which is thought to be, uh, um, it's related to adiposity, um, they went up in the opposite direction as all of these went down. And of these, IL-6 was the strongest marker. And so we put them together into um, an index, a biomarker index, and um, to see if we could explain the age effect on mortality. And it wasn't as strong as our other index, but it did uh, separate um, groups quite distinctly in terms of their risk for mortality. Um, so the idea would be to take things that you can measure in the blood and try to put those things together and see if you can um, estimate what somebody's risk is and somebody's, perhaps, biologic age. And if I get this figured out, I will have a booth on the boardwalk, and you can all come. So um, there's been lots of other attempts to do this. This um, person, Morgan Levine, um, did um, her training in gerontology, but then got very interested in this idea of biologic age. Um, and what she did was she took multiple factors. And if you look at these, most of these are routine blood tests. And they were done in a population study. They're not designed at all to measure aging. Most of them are um, here, like cated hemoglobin is for diabetes, serum creatinine for kidney function, CRP is inflammation. But a lot of these look at all those blood tests. That's what you get on a standard 
blood tests. But anyway, um, she put them all into a model and looked to see if it would predict better than chronologic age. Well, no surprise. Of course, it predicts better because it's more information than a chronologic age. But what they were able to do with it is then, for each individual, say whether they were older or younger than the chronologic age in terms of predicting risk. And um, this approach um, has been favored and, and used by others. Um, here's a, another interesting paper where they looked at whether um, aging is accelerated in African Americans that were in their cohort. And what they saw was that um, aging, if you use that as a measure of aging, um, was uh, greater, this is the race difference um, between blacks and whites, that it was greater in blacks than whites until um, early late life. And then as time went on, the survivors in the population actually um, had much less of a difference. And other people have reported this, that um, there is um, sort of a robustness in the people that, that survive the longest. So maybe um, that is a useful thing to do. Uh, this is a paper on um, using another biologic age index with some of some similar types of standard blood tests, but it also had cardiorespiratory fitness, which I was pleased to see, pulmonary function, which is the lungs. Um, and what they did was they looked at young people over time going from age 26 to 32 to see if they could use an index like this to track how someone was aging. And this is, um, again, sort of the individual systems all together, but you see they're kind of all going the same way. And he also came up with a, a way to say that these people who were 32 actually looked more like 26 years old and 32 year olds who looked like 38 year olds and um, could um, show that this um, could be measured in this way. But interestingly, this was not very strongly measured to their functional status. And I think it's because they're, um, they're young and that this really isn't their aging. This is really their cardiovascular disease and obesity and some other things. Now, you can argue that obesity is accelerating their aging, but um, I think that it was um, an interesting attempt to define aging early in life. It um, was something that they were then able to apply to the calorie study. The calorie study is a caloric restriction trial in humans. We know in animal models, if you don't feed them freely, if you keep them very thin, animals will live longer in the lab, rats, mice. And um, there is a human study going on where people who are in the study agree to eat less and to keep their weight really low. Um, and he applied this same change in the rate of biologic aging type metric to that study and was able to show that the caloric restricted population seemed to age more slowly over the 24 months of the study. These people were in their 50s and 60s. Another thing that people use is DNA methylation called the epigenetic clock. This looks at markers on the DNA that change as people get older. And if someone has a certain set of markers, um, you can look and see whether they have an epigenetic age that's older or younger than their chronologic age. Um, there were several ways that this was developed. Um, and what they're doing is they're looking at methylation on CPG sites on the DNA, which um, are running along the length of the DNA, and you're looking at methyl groups. So you're not really sure what they're doing, but they can be counted. Um, and what Steve Horvath did was he um, found that 353 of these sites were related to chronologic age. Um, well, he actually chose them because they were related to chronologic age. Hannum looked just in the blood. This one looked at multiple tissues. Looking just at the blood, he came up with 71 sites that are strongly related to age. And then Levine, who did that paper on the biologic age with all the risk factors, she optimized her choice of these CPG sites to this phenotypic age, which is the age adjusted for multiple markers of health. And um, 
so right now there's efforts to try to figure out um, whether this, how much this matters in terms of um, taking it to other populations. But there's also an effort to understand what the heck does this mean? Because these markers often are not on genes. They're on control regions of the DNA. And we don't really know what they're doing. So the biology of the epigenetic clock is not well understood, even if it predicts fairly well. The length of the telomeres has also been of great interest. What are telomeres? They're the tips of the chromosomes. If you don't have um, the tips on your chromosomes, your chromosomes unravel and become damaged. It's just like the caps on your shoelaces. And as cells divide and divide and divide, those telomeres get shorter and shorter until um, the cell recognizes that the DNA is about to fall apart and it uh, the cell will stop dividing. And this is a mechanism wh whereby cells can become um, senescent. This little picture shows them stained, so they're lighting up. Um, and it does appear that when you look at large population studies, that people's um, telomeres in their blood cells get shorter. And it's related to um, cardiovascular disease. It's related to mortality, but not very strongly. Um, and it's also of interest because there are syndromes where people have genetic short telomeres where they get um, specific diseases. So we know they're very important for DNA uh, control and um, maintaining the integrity of DNA. Um, I really like this paper because um, it shows what the flip side is of having um, a really long telomeres. If you keep your telomeres really long, it turns out that you're at higher risk overall for a variety of cancers. So some people say that cancer is the price that we uh, pay, or that aging, I'm sorry, <laughs> got it just backwards. Aging is the price that we pay to avoid getting cancer. So if you maintain your telomeres, you may be at greater risk for cancer. But if your telomeres get too short, you're going to age more quickly. That's not entirely true, because there are many types of cell damage that cause both cancer and seem to cause aging. But in the case of the telomere, you seem to have this, um, there's probably a point at which you want to maintain them neither too long nor too short. There's also um, interest in measuring senescence in cells. Senescence is a process that the cell is damaged, but it doesn't die. It just stops dividing. And it seems that these senescent cells in your body that are damaged, if you don't get rid of them, they secrete they cause an inflammatory response in the tissue. So there's an interest in whether or not we can tell how many um, um, senescent cells we have, or if we can measure this indirectly by measuring the secretory products of senescent cells. Um, called the Senescent Associated Secretory Phenotype, or SASP, um, and efforts going on now to try to determine, here's a healthy cell that's just not dividing. Here's a senescent cell that's kind of sick, but it's still working. And it's uh, perhaps causing this trouble. If it didn't senesce, it could become cancerous. So again, it's a mechanism to keep your cells from becoming cancerous. Um, Recently, um, colleagues at Wake Forest um, showed that from human tissues that they've collected, they're able to stain for these senescent markers. And it looks like uh, this is fat tissue, that they're not super common, but they're countable. And there are currently trials underway trying to remove these senescent cells. It's been shown that it works in animal models. Um, would it work in people? And then finally, um, a fascinating condition called clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. Um, so it appears that we acquire mutations um, in stem cells. And in this case, the bone marrow stem cells have mutations that give them a survival advantage so that as you get older, your blood cells are composed of fewer, a larger number of fewer um, damaged cells that have a survival potential. It was first of interest to see if it could predict leukemia as people got older and thought to be solely related to, um, to a, a cancer phenomenon. But it's been shown now that it's a general risk factor for 
cardiovascular disease, um, stroke, and, and overall mortality. So I think it's telling us something about the stem cell aging. Um, this is just showing you what happens, that you get a, a mutation that's acquired, and some of them um, expand. And if they have a lot of mutations, they expand into a cancer of the blood that takes over the bone marrow. But if they only have a few mutations, some of them just get um, expanded and um, increase in numbers, um, but they don't cause cancer, but they do seem to cause an immune system that functions less well and leads to other chronic diseases. Um, Daniel Belsky, who did that um, aging index in the younger people, tried to compare um, all these different ways of understanding biologic aging by looking at telomeres, epigenetic clocks, a composite of um, these indices of biologic aging that use multiple biomarkers. And um, I don't know if you would be surprised or not surprised, but these all seem to be telling us different things. And this is a correlation matrix um, that shows that the correlations here between the clock and the telomere length, 0 0.03, that's really, really small. Um, here is a biologic age index and uh, another epigenetic clock with the 71 CPG sites, 0 0.15. Um, the only ones that were correlated were within these types of epigenetic clocks or within these um, biologic age indices that use a lot of routine blood tests. Um, but in general, these things that were measured differently weren't very strongly related to each other. And again, they didn't uh, seem to report out at all on the physical or cognitive functioning in this cohort. So we have a long way to go to figure out how to do this. But it's um, of great interest right now because we know from animal models that aging is modifiable. And these are some of the um, things that have been used and done in models, systems, different types of organisms to increase life expectancy. Caloric restriction, as I mentioned before, a very well-known intervention that um, has been known since the 1930s. I heard a story that it's been known for that long because during the Depression, they didn't have enough feed for the animals, and they were surprised that they lived longer when they had to ration the feed. Maybe we all need to have our feed rationed. But, um, there's interest in whether we can develop drugs that are actually working in the same way as caloric restriction. They're called caloric restriction mimetics. There's been lots of genetic manipulations, and most of these block growth hormone and insulin signaling pathways and um, uh, may be, in a way, caloric restriction mimetics as well. Um, in terms of stem cell aging, I mentioned the CHIP phenomenon. Um, it's also, there's a study underway right now that um, giving older people stem cell transplants. Um, a pilot study showed that it decreased their frailty. Um, it's been well known in oncology that the younger the donor, if there's a bone marrow transplant, the better the outcome. So um, I don't think it's that big a leap to, um, to go to stem cell uh, transplants. Um, parabiosis is a process where you tie two animals together and the proteins circulate also probably some stem cells, but even if you block the stem cells, uh, there seem to be um, proteins in the blood that alter the aging process. So there's a picture of a couple of mice sewn together that the um, heterochromic uh, or chronic uh, parabiosis of the young and the old seems to rejuvenate um, the older mouse. And then I mentioned the... Um, um, process of senolysis, where you can remove senescent cells. This has been done in animal models and appears um, to also rejuvenate them, and there are human trials underway right now. So if um, these trials are going to be done, what should they measure to know if these things are working? Well, that's where some of these ideas could um, become useful. So here... Um, Two men the same age, two women the same age. Obviously, obesity is part of a <laughs> big part of the reason why they don't look to be the same age. Um, but um, this is where 
biomarkers could really become useful when you have groups of people who are all the same age, um, and you have to tell the difference between them. Um, so what should these measures look like? Well, I th most people agree that we really should be trying to measure the biologic aging process and not um, external risk factors that people are exposed to over time, things that are known to change with age, things that are known to predict mortality and functional decline. And unfortunately, a lot of these things are very hard to measure in people. They should be reliable um, and things preferably that you could measure from the blood or even from um, urine, saliva, hair, something that doesn't require tissue and um, be fast and cheap. But ultimately, we want things that would respond to intervention. Um, so how else could such markers be used? They could be used for predicting if somebody's going to tolerate a uh, stressor like chemo or major surgery. Now, chronologic age isn't that bad. If somebody's 90, they're probably not going to do very well um, with chemo or major surgery. And why is that? Because we know they've accumulated a lifetime of damage to multiple organ systems. But what if you're trying to tell the difference between two people who are 70? Um, and what if there was the potential that some of these things could be um, boosted ahead of a major stressor? If you knew somebody wasn't likely to tolerate something, maybe they should be pulled out of line and given some special uh, therapy that would boost their ability to tolerate it. Um, it would be helpful to be able to um, predict survival better, to understand um, uh, more than just by age, chronologic age alone, um, if there's time to benefit from screening or, or benefit from some major surgical procedure. Um, I also think it's possible that we could identify um, some of the molecular targets for, I call these the troublesome aspects of primary aging. So there are a lot of things that happen as people get older that don't count as diseases, but they're not fun to have. If your lenses get stiff and you need reading glasses, um, this is, uh, seems to be truly a universal aging process, and we don't know how to do anything about that, how to stop that. Uh, part of hearing loss seems to be age-related without other known risk factors, though in Western societies the um, loud music that we listen to doesn't help at all. Um, Peripheral nerve impairments are very common as people get older, and most of the time they're what we call idiopathic. They're age-related. Um, vascular stiffening, loss of muscle strength, some aspects of cognitive decline. All of these things um, might benefit from better understanding um, the biologic aging underlying them. Um, and then another reason to measure them is to identify um, who's benefiting from treatment before you have to wait and see if they live a long time. So um, IL-6 is a marker of inflammation. Um, I was involved in a trial trying to target IL-6 to improve function. Um, when we did it, we weren't really sure that we had the best measure, measure, so we measured like 10 things, and turns out it was probably the best measure, but we weren't able to change it. Um, and it might be that there are new markers or pathways um, that are being affected by things that we already do and we're not measuring them. So um, uh, just to wrap up briefly, um, I hope I've convinced you from what I've talked about today that age is more than a number um, and that um, still to this day we uh, measure it perhaps more precisely than we can measure biology. Um, age is a clock. We can measure it down to the second as to how old you are, <laughs> but we don't um, measure biology with, with as much precision. Um, but some of these measures do at least as well as chronologic age and predicting outcomes. Um, the ways that we get closer to biologic age, I think, are in process. Um, but those biologic processes of aging right now um, are not really accessible without getting uh, tissue from a person. And um, this is a major barrier to getting closer to these biologic aging processes. So that right now there's no single method or composite um, metric of one's biologic age 
that's agreed upon or well validated, but it's a very exciting area of research and I think we'll see a lot of project progress. So just to close with some recommendations for research, um, first of all, stepping all the way back, if you're a doctoral student working with me and you don't know what the coefficient for age is in your model, I will send you back <laughs> to go find that out to really understand what is age um, predicting or telling you um, when you're evaluating it. And also, just don't assume that age is one thing and you just put it in there. You have to look to see whether the risk of age is accelerating um, the risk of an outcome over time, or is there some interaction that age is more of a risk factor in some groups than others. Um, many times, um, people don't uh, realize that there is a lot of burden of disease that comes with getting older and so is um, age telling you about a time dependent exposure? Um, is it um, the functional decline? Is it the burden of subclinical disease? Um, all of those are part of age and um, there are several projects right now that I'm involved with trying to see if we can pull out um, markers of senescence from the blood or to use metabolomics techniques to try to come up with a signature that might be useful. Um, but I expect that multiple organ systems will need to be tapped and summarized to truly understand someone's biologic age. So perhaps in the future when you go to the doctor, the doctor will say something like this. You're 57 years old. Let's get that down a bit. Okay? <laughs> so I would just like to um, acknowledge that I've been involved in these large cohort studies with thousands of men and women who volunteered for them, and without them, these studies would not exist, um, as well as the long term support from NIH and many, many collaborating investigators, doctoral students, and postdocs that I've worked with. Um, and funding, uh, these are some of the projects that, that funded some of this work. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I think it's almost time. So maybe one question, and then we can take the questions, that, the, that the, our speaker can take the questions out in the, um, uh, while having wine and cheese. So yeah. To what extent does genetics play a role in the stage of So um, it's thought that perhaps at most 30% of um, how long you live is genetic, um, and it's very hard to sort that out from familial shared environment. That means that the vast majority of how you age is environmental, at least 70%. <laughs> Um, there have not been specific genes. It seems that it's all of the genes together. There are a couple that maybe predict um, the aging process, but for the most part, um, people have not come up with um, many genes. The APOE4 gene, which predicts Alzheimer's disease, seems to be related um, to early mortality, and the APOE2 to longer life. And then some of those genes in the nutrient signaling pathway may have a role um, because when you change them in animal models, it drastically changes their longevity. So those are the genes of interest, but that's not where the money is. It's in our environment and our lifestyles. Thank you. UTMB Health, working together to work wonders.